Hey, it's Liz Alto, and this is the Untame the Wild Soul Woman podcast. From body image, sex, spirituality, money and relationships, to motherhood, creativity, business, communication and desire, Untame the Wild Soul Woman is the place to come for real stories and powerful advice to help you reclaim and redefine womanhood in the 21st century. Elizabeth D'Alto here, your host for the Untamed the Wild Soul podcast. Today's guest is Martha Beck. This is one of those fangirl moments because she was one of those people I had to cross my fingers when I sent the email out to see if she'd come on the show because she's so busy. She runs her life coaching school. She's written a number of books with a new her newest one recently just came out. She travels all the time. She has a family. She is an incredible, incredible woman. She's hilarious. She's brilliant. She's quite magical. Although she'll tell you that it's just not that big of a deal, and we'll get into that. Uh, this is a fun, fun episode, one of my favorites ever. She even helps me analyze some of my dreams recently, and you'll be able to get the tool and the system that she uses to help me with that when you listen to the show. You are going to enjoy this one so much, probably one you're going to want to listen to more than once. And for those of you who were checking out the Wild Soul Movement virtual program, I received some guidance to leave enrollment open for a little bit longer, so you can still sign up for that. If you were thinking you missed out, you did not. Details for that are at untameyourself.com forward slash join dash us. And now for today's episode. Oh, God. You all are super special fangirl interview. You all remember how excited I was to interview Allison Armstrong. Well, this is my other big fangirl of 2016 moment. We have Martha Beck on the show today. Welcome, Martha. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. And I know a lot of our women already know who you are, but just in case anyone is unfamiliar, um, Martha Beck is an author and a life coach. She has written so many books, Expecting Adam, Leaving the Saints, Finding Your Own North Star, The Joy Diet, Steering by Starlight, and the one that literally changed my life in 2013, Finding Your Way in a Wild New World. She also has a new book that came out this year called Diana Herself, An Allegory of Awakening. And, and, I, and she has this amazing life coaching certification program. There are many special people in my life who are Martha Beck certified life coaches, including Michael, those of you who know my partner, Michael. So this is, this is super special, super awesome, and I really appreciate your time. So I'm just going to jump right in. Cool? Yes, indeed. Let's do it. So the first question I ask all guests, what do you love about being a woman? Ooh, you ask even the men that? That would be great. I ask, um, I ask the men what they love about being men. Oh, okay. I like, I like just everybody asking <laughs> what they all love about being a woman. <laughs> what do I love about being a woman? Um, I love the variety because I, I once talked to a guy who, in order to understand women, injected himself with estrogen and he said he had he said it was the worst like drug trip of his life he said the emotional range was something he'd never experienced before so there are and and most women we're walking around like it's no big deal and he was like I don't know how you people do this (laughs) and the fact is I think that I you know when I showed up on the planet I bought the ticket that you get at Disneyland with all the rides you know and we can cross over. We can act like men. Nobody freaks out if we wear pants. You know, if a guy wears a dress, he gets beaten to death. But we can kind of plug in anywhere um, at this particular time in history. Ask me 100 years ago, I just would have shot myself. But <laughs> this is a good time to be a woman. Of course, they didn't give women guns, probably for that very same reason, now that I think about it. So that's it. That's a great answer. So what, when you say at Disney World, if you got the ticket for all the rides, what's been most recently one of your favorite rides? Um, it's, the, I, I really think the whole economy is changing. I was trained as a sociologist and I've been watching as modern society cracks up with new technologies coming on board. And so I went off and started my own company and now I've started my own publishing house because I, I feel like we have to do a new form of everything mm. and it's just a big, huge adventure. And, um, so like starting over and over all to do things in a, like a different way, a wilder way, a way in which I have more independent control of my day and my life. It's, it sounds boring, but it's really not. <laughs> but that doesn't sound boring to me at all. In fact, you know, when Michael and I got together, we shared common fears of relationship, both of which were, losing our freedom and being bored. 
And mm-hmm. so when you talk about like an independent way of doing everything, to me, that just sounds like one of the most exciting possible things I could ever pursue in my life. Oh, it was so fun. And, you know, I've written all those books and it was like always the hardest thing that I did. And I loved, as Ernest Hemingway, Hemingway said, I love having written but I didn't love writing. And then I wrote a book that was absolutely for, I did not care what anyone thought about it except me. And my whole life just became this joy ride. I mean, everything I do that is sort of from this place of pure happiness and pure intention, life itself becomes this truly magical joy ride. And um, yeah, that never gets boring. That never gets boring. And so how did you... I mean, again, people could read all a million of your books and find these things out. But since we're here live, I'd love to ask, how did you find your way to living life with intention? I know part of your story is you have three Harvard degrees. So that's like really heady intellectual space. How did you, what what kind of invited you down a more like spiritual, conscious or self-aware path? Well, it really was the birth of my son or rather the diagnosis of my son with Down syndrome when I was pregnant at Harvard, you know, getting my third degree. And uh, I had to say, it wasn't that I was, I'm very pro-choice, but I had to decide what kind of a life was worth having for my child. Like I had an instinctive and overwhelming desire to keep him. That was like, that was what showed up for me emotionally, but then I had to justify it to my mind at a time when anyone, everybody around me was saying there is no justification. It's like, shoot the horse. It's going to suffer all its life. And I could not do it. And the reason was, as I looked around Harvard, I saw all these people I admired, people who were so brilliant and amazing. And it didn't feel to me like any of them was particularly happy. Mm. And I, I decided that the reason to live is to be happy. If there's no happiness in your life, it doesn't matter what you achieve who cares? I'm just here to figure out how to be happy. And that immediately, well, and then there was the fact that while I was pregnant, I became weirdly psychic and just had to deal with the fact that I was psychic, even though I didn't believe in psychics. That was a bit of a trick, I must tell you. So it, it really felt set up. It felt like a setup to just knock me out of my worldview and into something much, what I would have said, crazier. Mm-hmm. And now I think it's saner. <laughs> and what, so when you say becoming psychic, how did that come online for you? Like in what form were you now having access to things that you didn't before? The biggest one was something I later found out was called remote viewing, where you think of someone and you suddenly see what they're seeing. You, you basically are teleported into their body for a second. And you can see what they're seeing and smell what they're smelling and all of that. And my husband at the time was making these round trips to Singapore because that was an easy commute. He was in international business. And so he was gone a lot of the time. But when I would think about him, especially if he was thinking about me at the same time, I would see exactly what he was seeing, like very clear details of something like looking down from a plane and watching a thunderstorm over the Philippines. And, and then I could check it with him. Like, was there really a, did you walk down the street where there was a festival with, a, you know, lanterns everywhere? And he'd be like, yeah, that's exactly what happened. So we kept checking it and it, it, it checked out. And that, what do you do with that? You either throw it away or you try to have some academic integrity and work it into your worldview. Yeah, yeah. And, and how, how did people in your world react? Because I feel like we live in a culture that's not super accepting of things like that. Well, I only told a few people and, and they said, you know, just keep this to yourself. Um, <laughs> And and then I thought, okay, but it like, it was such an overwhelming curiosity. I mean, it's like, can you imagine if you went into your house one day and there was a little posse of leprechauns having a tea party or something? I mean, and it, you try, you checked and saw that it wasn't a drug overdose and right. like tried the usual explanations. A lot of people just tuck those things away. I couldn't keep it tucked away Yeah, because see, my baby had not died. And that was the that was the issue. If the baby had died, I would have been able to go back to my old worldview, grieve the loss of a child and move on. But I had this, this supposed disaster that was something I had to take care of every day Mm. and, and love and hope for and, and try to make his life work. So I couldn't sink back into the other worldview without making it unbearably depressing to have a child with Down syndrome. 
And I actually read that you don't ever finish the grieving process if you have a child with a disability. You just grieve forever. I was like, oh, this is fun. Thanks so much for telling me that. But the fact is, you only grieve forever if you refuse to question your worldview. Mm. If you refuse to question the belief system that is causing the suffering. And when you start to question the belief system that's causing the suffering, suddenly all bets are off and you realize you can create life any way you want to. You just have to be willing to have people think you're weird. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, so was it, was it scary for you at all? And here's, I'm very selfishly asking this question because something in the last couple of years, I've started to have some psychic senses come online as well. And I have done every possible thing I can to slow it down, numb it, shut it down. And not- oh, me too. Yeah. Me yeah. too. And yeah, it scared the living daylights out of me. Yeah. When I was pregnant with Adam, the thing was, I was so, I was very, very physically ill and I was so heart sick that I was like, whatever. I had no resistance left in me. And that's why mm-hmm. I think it was so strong then. And also because he is crazy psychic and he was living in my body at the time. Yeah. So he was like a little radio broadcaster in there, um, sending out a signal. But yeah, it's scary. And it's still scary because you'll see if you don't fight it, if you allow it and you train it and you test it and you get rigorous with it, what happens is it gets more consistent. Yeah and stronger. So you really, I just continuously have to make the choice. Do I let myself get even weirder in the eyes of the world? Yeah. Okay. And and the answer has been yes, huh? (laughs) Yeah, it's been yes, because I am one of those people who can't, I just have a very, very low tolerance for suffering. Yes. So I can't endure the world. Like I found out the other day that Within five years, moose are expected to be extinct. I can't handle that without some kind of a a worldview that goes beyond the purely mechanical. There has to be some kind of meaning in all of this, or I am out. I am history. Just press eject. I'm leaving. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, it's what, um, it's what, uh, was it Camus? He said the only really serious question left to, to modern philosophers is whether or not to commit suicide. Because we're all going to suffer. We're all going to die. Why stick around for the suffering? Why not just jump to the death? And that has always been very up for me. I, like from childhood on, I was like, this, I think I got off on the wrong planet. Could we, could we just double check? <laughs> so I, it's one or the other. I go into despair or I go into the, into the mystery. And the mystery is pretty awesome, literally. And so I keep going into that. Yeah. Do you still get caught up in despair at all now or not really? I do sometimes. I mean, it's it's interesting. It's like a toggle switch. Sometimes when I'm very tired, like right now, I just got back from Africa. I was super jet lagged. And I can go to the old places for a little while. Uh, and it, it's not fun. And I get out faster and faster. Um, but boy, those those automatic negative thoughts, as one of my friends calls them, they get deep, deep in your psyche. And I, I almost feel like we're at some sort of spiritual gymnasium where the idea is not to lift that weight up to that height and keep it there, but it is to, you know, you exercise faith in like exploring what's happening to you in paranormal moments and then lose the faith the way you would put a weight down after you'd lifted it and then lift it again and then lose it again and lift it again because we're not there to perform. We're not here to perform a a mechanical task. We're here for the strength that comes from repeatedly losing our faith and then finding it again. That's what we're here for. And that strength grows with every new experience. And then guess what happens? Life or the force or whatever adds more weight (laughs) <laughs> so the next time you have to lift more. <laughs> it just keeps happening. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> it's so I'm like, funny. Seriously? Again, like, I am lifting this thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like, like I was so unafraid of money. I was like, I have got it. I've got enough tucked away. I can live on this. I'm not young. My kids have, you know, I, I will leave them enough. I can give people generous gifts. And then I got this overwhelming compulsion to buy a ranch that cost exactly all my money. Oh my and goodness. I was like, are you serious? <laughs> are you serious with this? <laughs> Gosh, I would, if I were not on 
being recorded, I would swear like a sailor right now because that's how I feel when these things happen. Yeah, it's so it's so interesting. The journey never ends. So so there's two never ends things specific to you that I'd love to ask you about. One of them is a story I've only heard through a third party, and I'd love to hear it from you if you're willing okay, to share it. Okay, hit me. I'm a huge fan of the Byron Katie work. I've recommended yeah. it to tons of people. It comes up on the show all the time. Super brilliant. Oh, yeah. And actually, so a friend, a friend of ours who is one of your coaches was telling us how you had this big epiphany at dinner with Byron Katie about the work relatively recently, right? Oh, yeah. This is, oh, this was amazing, and it changed my life so much. And I'm actually, just today, I was talking to um, Byron Katie's husband, Stephen Mitchell, who's one of my favorite writers, and I am ready to write the book that they started for me that day. Because <laughs> I've been doing this thing where somebody would, say somebody stole something from me, and I thought, well, that's just not very nice. But then I would go and do the work, you know, and I'd say, well, let's see. You know, she did steal something from me, so that's the way things are. So I'm not going to fight that. So I'm going to, let's see, there's the thought, she shouldn't have stolen that. And I feel angry when I think she shouldn't have stolen that. So I'm going to stop thinking that and just embrace having things stolen from me. Mm-hmm. And Katie was like, what are you doing? That's not how it works. <laughs> I was like, really? How does it work? And she says, well, you know to do things if they're in your integrity And then you do them and you offend people. And then you get to do the work on your own reaction to their disapproval. Mm. And I was like, oh, my God, I've been using the Byron Katie work to kind of cringingly get around the idea of having to confront someone sometimes, Mm. you know? Yeah. I've been using it to make myself a doormat. And that is not how Katie uses it at all. Right. So I started something called my integrity cleanse. And uh, it's just like, like saying exactly what you mean all the time, not lying ever, being the same person in front of, you know, I try to be the same person on this broadcast that I would be if you and I were hanging out and having coffee together it is one person. That's what integrity means. It's scary as heck, but it's so liberating. Whoa. So for anyone listening or watching who, just a real quick recap on the Byron Katie work, it's basically thought work. And the whole purpose is to look at how you're reacting to things or or how you're reacting to other people reacting to you and and loving what is, getting cool with what is. Yeah, I should have explained that. Sorry. No, no, no. That's okay. I didn't explain it either. But now we we just went backwards. It's totally fine. Uh, But really, a lot of people listening already know what it is and probably use it. Okay. So If they don't, Google it. In ter- yeah, the work, uh, just Byron Katie, the work, and we'll put a link for it in the show notes as well. There's this incredible PDF. I recommend it to people all the time. It's literally life altering. Even when you've been doing it for years, every time you go back and do it again, you're like, yes. Oh, thank you. I know. It's so awesome. So what yeah. were, when you were doing the integrity cleanse, where were the places and spaces where it was actually, you found yourself to be most incongruent? Oh, I'm still on the integrity cleanse. I'm like on day 500 something. <laughs> And I've had a few slips, but not many. Mm -hmm. The biggest thing is, well, for example, I'll I'll tell you right now, I'm going to LA tomorrow to do, to do some interviews. And I've got a friend there who's really impressive and, and a little intimidating, intimidating, even though she's sweet as sugar. I mean, the sweetest person, but she said, do you want to go to dinner? I'm going to dinner with some famous people. And I my first thing was I thought, well, yeah, this is the kind of invitation one with and is thrilled, but I was not thrilled. And I had to sit with myself and realize that I just don't want to get dressed up and make small talk with strangers. Mm. So I, I texted her and I said, here's the deal. I love you. And I want to spend time with you, but I don't want to dress up and make small talk with strangers. How about I just wait for you until your dinner's over and then we can talk. And I know it sounds like no big deal, but I cannot tell you how tied up I used to get in trying to be polite Yeah, and yeah. trying to like figure out what someone wanted and do what they wanted and make everything nice for everybody. Yeah. And instead to just say the guts out truth, I don't want to go to dinner with you, but I love you. Mm-hmm. That, to me, that's like, that's a whole new realm of behavior for me. And then also saying to people like <laughs> a woman came and snuggled up to me, physically snuggled up to me once and said, you know, I'm so glad that I can do this with you. And I'm, I'm so glad that you'll tell me 
if it bothers you. And I just looked at her and I said, um, now that you mention it, <laughs> I, it's bothering me. And yeah. she went away feeling really bad. And, uh, you know, uh, Katie would say, better her going away feeling bad about the truth to do her own work than me sitting there growing resentful of her because yes. I was letting her closer than my integrity really wanted her. Yeah. So it's, oh, it does, it just flushes all the people who aren't in integrity right out of your life. And the people who stay are all the people who genuinely love the real you. Yeah. Oh, this is so great. So I, I wrote my first book last year. And one of the things that I included in it is this conversation, how to have a courageous conversation framework. And a lot of it is about this. It's about really hmm. saying what you mean. And you can back it with the energy of love and the best intentions. And then really, it's just not taking responsibility for how people respond and react isn't your gig. Um, right. I, had, I had a great one just the other day. I had um, a friend was over just passing through and, and Michael and I just had a really intense conversation. I was really tender and sensitive and she was like, oh, can I come over and give you some forehead kisses? And I just said, no, but thank you so much for asking. Um, yeah. and, and it was cool. And there was no, there was no tension. There was no muckiness. And, and I meant that. Thank you so much for asking. A phrase that um, some of my friends use that I dig is, thank you for taking care of your needs. So when someone asks, mm -hmm. you, they know. A friend asked if she could stay with me one weekend and I was really tired and Michael was gone. And I was so pumped to have the house to myself. And I said, you know what? Yeah. I, am, I am loving having the house to myself. So I'm not available for that. And her response was, thank you for taking care of your needs. Best response ever. It felt so good. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Right? And the people who really want you to do anything different, they disappear pretty quickly after yeah. you start being honest with them. Time. And you realize the people around you are like people who are down with your truth. And there yeah. is that is intimacy. That is love. And that one step of being completely congruent in all situations was, it was like I'd been digging a tunnel with all this self-help work through a mountain and know that I was making progress because I could see all the rubble I was pushing behind me. Mm -hmm. But it, when I started doing the total integrity thing, it broke through into like the sunlight yeah. and it finally connected everything. And I felt that continuous upwelling of happiness that people talk about yes. that I had never been able to sustain for all that long. And everything just makes, it's just, it's like a puzzle piece fitting into place. There's just a click, a feeling of such peace and like oh, relief and joy. Yeah. It's, it's awesome. And it's so, it's so energizing and relaxing. You don't realize until you're not doing those things anymore, actually how much energy they require. Oh my gosh. And a, a lot of people, you know, I had all these autoimmune diseases. And so a lot of my clients will ask about those. And I really think one of the reasons we develop degenerative illnesses is that continuous striving to figure, to be pleasing instead of to be honest. Yes. Oh. And Oh, it's, it's exhausting. And the body just freaking hates it. <laughs> right, right. So it'll do anything to get your attention to enforce you. Right. You actually have right. to say no because you don't feel well. Yep. So I appreciate this so much. I appreciate the contact, the frame, and the stories because, I mean, this is a conversation that comes up on the show all the time, how it really is not integrous to be constantly putting other people first. I think our nope. culture says that makes you a good person. Take care of others. Yep. Give first. And we're saying the opposite. And there's so many great examples to support it as truth. Oh, yeah, I, that's so right. And also, uh, it's, it's a good thing to note that men are told that it's a good thing to put work ahead of themselves. Oh, interesting. And ahead of relationships. So men are really, really in a in a sociocultural bind right now and they're suffering tremendously because they've been told that to be real men, they have to be, they have to be focused almost entirely upon these jobs that are, are no longer um, growing. In fact, they're, they're disappearing. Mm -hmm. So that's why I went out and said, I'm going to do my own publishing. I'm going to do my own everything. Yeah. Just see if it can be done because I want to set men free, even though I've primarily been to a female audience. I'm, it's not just us trying to over caretake. It's also men trying to, to overwork 
over provide it's women doing both <laughs> yeah yeah and and i appreciate this because so i also i work with women and, and having michael you know he works with men and seeing and really learning and seeing how men struggle and suffer in this odd time where women can do everything and think they should right so we kind of get yep. that messed up we we get a lot of that man programming as well and we take it yeah. on so then men are trying to provide for themselves and we're going i'll do it myself they are quite lost in a lot of ways well, it's not just that either. It's that it's um, the women are torn to shreds because one system says put your work as an individual with we're pretending you have no needs as a as a biological organism or as an emotional being. So women get told do do both sides of these incompatible things, <laughs> and men aren't told to do both sides, but their role has been crushed down into this tiny you are what you earn sort of definition of self that doesn't like I was reading about what the animal not the animals the uh, Native Americans used to do in the area where I live and they lived for 6,000 years by hunting fishing making pottery um, doing some ag agriculture little gardening here and there and I thought you know basket weaving all this stuff and I looked at that and I thought they have classes for all these things that like community art centers because they're inherently fun like people yeah. on vacation go hunting and fishing even though i'm not a hunter people do it and people make throw pots and make baskets for fun no one in those indian tribes ever did a spreadsheet because it was so inherently fun right, right? yeah there were no accountants going man if i couldn't do this i would not make it through the week no the stuff that humans did for thousands of years involved moving the body, being in nature, all these things. And the male body is designed for that. And then we shove it into a box and tell it it has to be happy there. And yeah. I don't like that. I don't yeah. think it's good. And I see, I see the effects too on, um, you know, so for many years, my partner, Michael, he traveled around the world. He was nomadic for like two and a half years, just on the go, traveling, having all these experiences. And then when, when he stopped doing that, we moved here to San Diego. Um, he was dying in the house, dying in the house. Yeah. He didn't leave yeah. the country. He didn't go on any major trips for like a year and a half. And I kept being like, you got to go, you got to go, you got to go. Finally, he started traveling again. He went to Peru this year. He went to Japan. And, and now he has this saying, he's like, amazing things happen when I leave the house. Because that, I mean, mm -hmm. finally built for that. Yep. And that's why my last book is about going wild. And I call it bewilderment, bewilderment. Mm -hmm. And it's because there's not even room for, in, in my mind, there's no room left for, for kowtowing to any level of the culture at all. Yeah. We're in a time yes. when the oh, only way to cope man. is to be your wild self and like roam wild. Yeah. Which is what it sounds like Michael's been doing. That's what he's been doing. That's why this is called the Untamed the Wild Soul podcast. And it's really just oh, there you go. Just coming that home word. to nature. It has to be. And people, I think people hear the word wild or untamed, which I use a lot in, in the business. And the name of the book is Untamed uh -huh. Yourself. And they go, oh, they think it means like barefoot screaming naked in the woods. But it's really just true nature for each individual person. And for some people, it is like a loud expression or, or something or more in nature no, well, or even with animals. Yeah, but, but what you see in nature is that animals are incredibly intelligent and non-destructive. Mm -hmm. And that when we are wild, we are at our least destructive and our most compassionate and our most happy. Yeah, it's Thoreau said that most men lead lives of quiet desperation. He was talking about men who'd been pulled out of the fields and the and the woods and into factories. He yeah. wasn't just talking about people in general. He was talking about people who were trying to make a, war, a life with without connection to nature, without wildness. Wildness is in short supply here, and we need a lot more of it if we're going to keep living as a species on the planet. We're messing things up terribly. Yeah. Big time. Um, so I know you have spent time with wild animals, like some, some oh, yeah. types of wild animals that people would be very scared of. Yes? Yes. I just, I still have a little jet lag from, from being at Londolozi, this place in Africa, where I go to do seminars for about a month every year. And um, yeah, it's interesting to see. My dog goes past the window and I, my whole body like quirls to see, just to check if it's a leopard. You know, it's like you get this automatic response that is so tuned into the wilderness that um 
I, there are chipmunks on my ceiling. And when I realize it isn't monkeys, I'm sort of like, oh, crestfallen. So yeah, I've been, I, I surround myself with these creatures um, or I am, I am blessed to be surrounded by these creatures for a, at least a month a year. And, um, oh my gosh, has it changed my life? It's, you know, it's part of the integrity cleanse because I can't really be happy uh, without wildness anymore. Yeah. So I'm glad you're doing this show. Thank you. Thank you. Man, I can't believe you get to be around leopards. So I have a couple of spirit animals that either have been in my dreams or are just so present in my life, and, and leopards are one of them. What is it like? Really? Yes. Well, it's, they're the shaman animals. They're the, the, it's always the solitary cats. Like the lions are bigger, tigers are, tigers are bigger. But in every culture, that, every culture, even in Europe where there were no big cats, they chose the house cat as the witch's companion, right? Mm. And then they vilified that and burned all the herbalists because, who were women because, you know, the patriarchy needed them out of the way. But yeah, the cats, the, the, if you dream of leopards, this is what happened to me. I started dreaming I was being killed by a leopard. And it was one of the most vivid dreams I've ever had. And it repeated and repeated and repeated until I, I just said, oh, I know what to do. I got to just let it kill me. So I did. And, um, and in the dream, the leopard killed me. And then it sort of devoured the top half of my body while it just disappeared into the bottom half. And we were just one creature. And you tell that to someone from a tribe in Africa and they'll say, oh, okay, you're a Sangoma and you need training. You're a, a medicine person and you need training. Mm-hmm. And so if you've been dreaming of leopards, you're probably a medicine person who needs training. That's just my guess. And how do I get the training? Well, that's why I wrote Finding Your Way in a Wild New World, as you know. Um, yeah. And that's what we actually try to do it. We call it, I call it life coaching and they let me do it. And then it's a total bait and switch because it's like, okay, you came here to be a life coach, but what you really are doing is entering Hogwarts. (laughs) Yeah. That's amazing. Here we are. Let's go do this. And then things get really, depending on how much you do it. And the magic isn't what you'd expect. The magic is things like you were, we talking about the Byron Katie work, learning not to believe your own thoughts. It's not magic in itself, but if you do it, you will become magical. I've seen it happen yeah, to yeah, so yeah. many people that I can just flat out state it. Yeah. If you do that, you'll become magical. Cool. And yeah. And then the miracles happen, but you don't even care because that's not the point. The point is the joy of the journey. Yes, yes. All right. I'm so glad you said that because there's, there's a story. Michael refers to it all the time at some conference or some event where you said that. You were talking about not being attached to the magic because, man, I see that so much. So we live in Encinitas, California. This is a very you know, spiritual community. People call themselves conscious, self-proclaimed, all these types of things. A lot of people right. here are doing very amazing work in the world. But I find, and in my work as well, because um, I've been training just the way that you said, life coach and all that. And people do. I feel like people get so like, it's like the spiritual indulgence or the spiritual attachment to something needing to be magical or mystical or whatever. When yeah. sometimes the biggest, most incredible shifts and insights happen very simply. Yeah. And in some Indian traditions, they call it the time of the CDs, uh, S-I-D-H-I, I think, mm-hmm. um, or maybe double D. Anyway, it's a time when you'll go through a period of having miraculous things happen around you simply because that's how the process works. Yeah. And my favorite story is about a Tibetan Lama who was doing meditation, doing meditation. The Chinese came, his master ran away to India. He started having all these visions and things and magical things happen. And he walked from uh, Tibet over the Himalayas, over the Himalayas (laughs) and found his master. It took him four years. And when they finally found him and they embraced and they hugged him, he said, okay, I came to ask you, I'm, I'm seeing all these miracles and magical things are happening. What should I do with that? And the master said, oh, they don't really mean anything. Just keep meditating. And he said, okay, and walked back. <laughs> and it, I mean, that's, that's what it is. It's not because that desire for things to be um, paranormal in a, a sensationalistic way mm-hmm. is part of the immaturity of being, connect, being bound to materialism and being the grasping of things like money and power and narcissism and 
if you want to see how far those get, just watch the politics for yeah. a while today. Do you really want to go that way? Because the other way is the way of the renunciate who really is after that upwelling of continuous peace and joy, not look at me now, I have a bigger car and I'm president, you know, right. or whatever. Right. Uh, this is really yeah, funny. A- oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say it's a really interesting critical juncture for people when the magic does start start to happen. Do you stop there or do you forge on? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. one of my um, – you referenced Hogwarts, so I'm assuming you're a Harry Potter fan. I call it sometimes oh, I just yeah. need to like muggle out a little bit. I'll just watch TV. Mm-hmm. Not to numb, but just to like take a freaking break. And one of the things I love to watch is the Jimmy Fallon show. And he recently uh-huh. had Barack Obama was on the Jimmy Fallon show. And he does oh, these man. things called thank you notes. And one of them, it was just so funny. This is completely random. I'm just sharing it with you because I feel like you would enjoy it. Uh, Barack mm-hmm. Obama, the thank you note was like, dear Congress, thanks for wanting to replace me with a Republican for the last eight years. And then a picture of Donald Trump pops up and he says, how do you like me now? <laughs> Oh, <laughs> it was funny. Oh dear! But that's about the extent to which I in, engage myself with politics. So you right. mentioned you mentioned dreams, and this was actually on my list of a couple things I wanted mm-hmm. to ask you about because I have talked. I love. I've I've been a vivid dreamer my whole life, and it wasn't cool. until you know three or four years ago maybe that I started to look at these dreams and go, "What's going on here? What's the mm-hmm. information here?" And I know you created or you teach a framework of how to engage with what's going on in your dreams, right? Yeah, it's really simple, which doesn't mean it's easy. And it's based on Jungian uh, dream analysis, Carl Jung, the great psychologist. And it requires being able to act um, things out the way I used to do in, in high school drama class, where you like, you're all going to pretend to be an ice cream cone melting in the sun. And you're all, <laughs> and they're like idiots pretending to be ice cream cones. So what you have to do is you you write the dream down and then one by one you take each symbol and you step into character as the symbol and start to talk about yourself. And you cannot do it talking about the symbol from the perspective of the mind you usually have. You have to go inside the symbol and speak as the symbol. And not everyone can do it. But like I had a dream about the leopard. I would have to say, okay, to, to analyze it, I am the leopard. Okay, describe myself. And I think, oh, it was scary. It was fierce. No, no, no. Be the leopard. Okay. I am the leopard. I am relentless. I am mystical. I am benevolent. I am ferocious. Okay. So what message do you have for Martha, the dreamer? Um, Let go of all self. Let go of all self. Let go of all self. And that just pops up. And I don't, I mean, I had that dream years ago and it works even after years. Yeah. So if you want to throw a symbol out there, we can do it. Um, I mean, I the other animal in my dreams a lot whales. I get a lot of whales in my dreams. <gasps> me too. Okay, let's see if whales are the same for you as they are for me. Okay. Oh, cool. Yeah. Oh my God, the whale dreams are intense. All right. So pick a dream and become the whale or the whales. You can do plurals too. Okay. All right. So are you one whale or are you many whales? I am one big blue whale. Gosh, we've been dreaming the same dream, dude. Okay. Um, So be the big blue whale and feel your body, the hugeness of your body. Feel the ocean water around you. Feel what it's like to look down into the darkness. Feel what it's like to look up at the surface. And just be the the whale and start giving me adjectives to describe yourself. I am the whale and I am. I am the whale and I am am vast. Yes, good. Keep going. I I am huge. So huge, but I am so gentle. Mm, mm, keep going. I, 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 I'm so friendly, but people are afraid of me. Uh huh. I and go ahead. What's your message for Elizabeth Whale? How are you trying to help her? What are you trying to communicate to her? Uh, you are you are vast, and people will be afraid. You just keep Ooh. going. You just keep swimming. Oh, okay. So is there any, asking the whale, is, what can Elizabeth do in her daily life that will be, that will help her just keep swimming, even if someone's afraid? Stay in your native waters and you know what those are. Ooh. 
So are you, are, is this landing for you? It's super landing. Isn't That's, it? And you know, it's funny. That was a specific. So, I mean, I've had tons and tons of whale dreams and often it's orcas and often there's dolphins with the orcas, but yeah, I've the, often, I have dolphins and whales, no orcas. Oh, I got to cool. order some orcas. Oh, cool. So, but, but there've been a handful of times over the last few years where there's has been like a big blue or a big gray whale. And that yeah. one, I just remembered that image, like that specific image. That was awesome and so relevant, and so helpful right now. I recently bought a paddleboard because I haven't had whales or dolphins in my dreams lately or the, or the ocean. And I'm like, oh, it's because I live by the ocean and I need to actually well, go get in. Okay, well, try this one. Try this one. Become the ocean in the dream. Not the ocean in normal life. The ocean in the dreamscape. Ooh. Okay? So I am the ocean. I am, and start to describe yourself. I am the ocean. Ooh, it's similar. I am fierce and I am feared and often misunderstood. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And what's your message for Elizabeth? Uh, my message for Elizabeth, literally. Go her. Literally go with the flow. Oh, that's so <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so as I did this, like for me, as I kept analyzing, um, you know, I am the whale, I am the whale, suddenly I would realize, oh my gosh, I am, I am a creature of spirit. For me, the, the ocean, not for everybody, but for me, the ocean is spirit, the yeah. realm of spirit. And the dolphins and whales are the beings that can exist, that can breathe the air of the material world, but live in spirit. And um, I was so afraid of that blue whale and I, it took me forever to do the analysis. I would literally, my heart would pound just trying to analyze the dream. And I could not make myself into the whale. Oh, because no way. I was so afraid of it. And when I finally got into the, the image of the whale, what came out was, I am the whale. And wait, dude, you're so cute. You're such a little thing. You're so scared and wiggly. You're just such a wiggly, piggly little thing. We think you're just so cute. It was like so completely the opposite of what I thought. That's hysterical. You know? Yeah, it's, it's, it was so benevolent. And um, it's so cool that, that we have similar dreams. And this is something that I'm finding, and I wrote about that in my last book, that more and more um, we are dreaming the same dreams, literally. Yeah. Yeah. We had a medicine man come stay at the house to, to work with a friend of mine who was chronically ill. She ordered a ceremony. So he came and they, they had this seven day ceremony together and it, they would wait. They only slept like two hours a day. He would wait for her to fall asleep. And then once she was asleep, he would fall asleep and enter her dream Wow! and then coach her through the dream. And they would wake up and come to breakfast all groggy and say, she'd be saying things like, you know, I've, I've been to the waterfall, but I never knew how to get past it. Like they'd been playing a video game together. Oh. <laughs> and he'd be like, he'd be like, yeah, you have to go behind the waterfall. That's the secret. And she was like, why didn't I think of that? And we just would sit there looking at them like, are, are you people for real? That's awesome. It was awesome. You know what? I'm a, we don't need to go through it right now, but I can't wait. Like literally as soon as we hang up, the most interesting dream I had recently with the ocean was I was, I was at a beach. There were a whole bunch of people I knew and they're actually, there might've been a leopard in this one too. They've been all over the place lately, but I'm looking out in the ocean and literally Batman is in the ocean and Ooh. my friend's husband's name is Robin and Robin mm -hmm. is in the ocean as well in a business suit. So Batman and Robin- uh -huh are in the ocean. And, and it was actually one of my first lucid dreaming experiences that I could recall because I walked out of the wow. water and said to everyone on the beach, Hey, you guys, I know I'm dreaming, but Batman is in the ocean right now. <laughs> okay. So become Batman, Batman in the dream. Oh my God. I'm Batman in the dream. I am Bat. I'm Batman. <laughs> Batman in the dream. So adjectives. I want adjectives. Oh I'm God. what? Smart, rich, Funny, what? I'm, I'm, I'm solemn. I'm very solemn, and I'm very uh -huh. focused on what I'm doing. Uh huh. And what is your message for uh, Elizabeth? Um, you don't need superpowers to help people. Mm. I think this is going to be a really rich symbol for you. You should write, like, sit and let Batman write everything out. Yeah. But I think it's just what you were saying that we think superpowers are what's going to save us, right? Yeah, yeah. And what's really going to save us is this, is going into the water, going into spirit. 
Uh-huh. That's, and so that's why you threw Batman in, plus the symbol of business for you, yeah. the Robin person. In a business suit, they're all going into the ocean. They're all becoming part of spirit. Yeah. That and is so um, that's really different from anything that's ever happened in our lifetime or the lifetimes of those before us. Yeah. Oh, it's so juicy and fun. So It is. And it's so cool that it maps up so closely. Like you and I, have we ever even spoken before? No. <laughs> And we're having the same damn dreams. It's bizarre and fabulous, and it means nothing except keep going. <laughs> <laughs> and it means nothing. That That's so interesting. I think that piece about h- humans being such meaning-making machines and actually yeah. how that causes so much of the suffering. Uh, I was having a conversation mm-hmm. – uh, actually, it was on a recent podcast interview, I forget, uh, with my friend Christine Hassler. She's written a bunch of books, too. She's awesome. And we were talking about how so many people, they dig, they dig, they dig. They're excavating. They're wanting to uncover their blind spots. And all the while, there's stuff that's, like, glaring in their face that needs to be handled. And they're going, yep. but what's the blind spot? Yep. And we all have them. And that's why I think this this is becoming the time of community because – I've been in more and more groups where we end up sitting and and talking about our blind spots and other people can always see them, but we, by definition, cannot. So it's the time to like bring it all out of the closet and start talking about what's happening to us Yeah. because it's either happening to you or it isn't. And for people who, there may be people listening to this who are like, what are these people smoking? You know, (laughs) like I have never had that experience, but there are others who are going, I had the same dream, you know, I was like, <laughs> there's something, it's not an exclusive, we're in the club and you're not thing. It's just yeah. like, there's a certain job to be done. And some of us have, are sort of assigned to that task. And yes. it's time for us to go through this process of, of waking up to what we're supposed to do. Yeah. I appreciate that, that we point a lot because I think people compare themselves and they, they do the inferior superior thing. And, and no, judge. that's part of the old thing. Yeah, yeah, big time. It doesn't, you know, doesn't work in the new, in the wild new world, as you say. Yeah, there aren't pyramids in the ocean. I mean, if they are, they're just, they're all under the water. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, we've got to go to a much more fluid way of being where everyone, uh, the definition of a functional group is a group where the roles change continuously and everyone can be available to support anyone on a given day and be supported the next day. You know, yeah, I love that. So that's all it is. It's so, a fluid, supportive thing. I want to ask you one more question, which, you know, as someone, I mean, brilliant, brilliant, very active mind, so much education, so much life experience across like all kinds of realms that it sounds like you spend time in and have studied and have experienced. This is going to sound like such a simple question. Do you have any consistent daily practices or rituals to keep yourself sharp or moving forward or growing or however you want to put it? It's such a great question. That is the absolute great question. I have a very, very strong ritual. I get up every morning. I have the same, I have my little, I have a little green tea ceremony. It used to be coffee. And then one day my body just went, nope. So I switched to green tea and I didn't do it to be virtuous. It just happened. And then I go and set out my little meditation cushion and I read from, I have a little bookshelf of my favorite books that help put me into a feeling centered and, and still and good. And then I meditate for, I, for a year I did it about an hour and 15 minutes every single day without a single break then late, then I started to travel and it got to be more, sometimes it's only half an hour. And when I have to go to half an hour, I feel like I'm starving. Oh, interesting. I feel like I am ravenous for more meditation. And I can, like people who think that they can shortcut to, um, I call it, <laughs> they want to feel like, a spiritually oriented person feels without doing what a spiritually oriented person does. They want the benefit of meditation without actually meditating. Yeah. And I totally understand that. And I don't think it's wrong and I don't think it's bad, but for me, there is no shortcut and I don't want there to be because meditation, which can be so 
it can be so grinding sometimes. Like it is not easy to sit there every single day, but the reward is just phenomenal. And then something happens and you basically, it's like I'm sitting there on my cushion one day and I just sort of noticed that everything is a miracle and that because everything is a miracle, there's nothing special about miracles. Miracles are the way it is. And it just was like, oh, <laughs> and it was like the, the world flew open, but no, there were no clouds and there were no claps of thunder and there were no lightning bolts. I've gotten those, but this was just like, oh, and it was like, wow, you know, it was the biggest thing that ever happened to me. And it was so small. And I, I can't even describe it. You kind of have to meditate your way to it or find another way, whatever your path is. Yours will feel good to you. Yes. Don't do what I do, but do something. Do something. So that was supposed to be my last question, but because of something you said, I have one more quick one. What are those favorite books? Ooh, let's see. Right now, one of my favorites is I Am That by Nisargadatta Maharaj. Um, I always have loved the Tao Te Ching, especially Stephen Mitchell's translation. I love um, all of Byron Katie, Katie's books, but the most recent one, A Thousand Names for Joy, is mm. a particular favorite. Uh, then I have I have a lot of them actually. Um, some other the path of the path of the heart. I think Jack Cornfield. Um, whole bunches of them. books about near-death experiences because I had one of those once and sometimes yeah. I want to revisit that. And it just depends. I just let myself be drawn to whatever book feels juicy on the day that, you know, as I sit there. And it's just, I'm fed every single day. I call them my paper mothers. I love that. Yeah. A friend of mine recently said books are my mentors. And I've, I mean, ever since I learned to read, I love, love, love books. Have you read on, on the near-death experiences, have you read Anita Morjani's Dying to Be Me? I just read it. Yesterday, my partner, Karen, said, if you say Anita Morjani's name one more time, I'm oh going to shoot God. myself. I didn't I am it. obsessed I with that it. book. A couple years oh. ago. Amazing. Amazing. I, I mean, that's so funny you would ask me that because that is my current obsession is Anita. Yeah. That's the most recent new book that I've read that I put on that shelf. So <laughs> good. I love stuff Ooh, like I that. I love that. Oh, that was so magical and it meant nothing. <laughs> exactly. It's just now we can walk home across the Himalayas because magic happened. <laughs> oh my God, Martha, thank you so much. This was so fun. Uh oh. The women are going to love it for you. sure. Um, if you want more Martha Beck in your life, if you want, I mean, you could just go to Amazon, type in her name and see which book calls you. They're all great. You can go to her website, MarthaBeck.com. We'll link up to some of the other things we mentioned in the show notes. And if anyone listening or watching wants to continue this conversation, you know, we're always doing that in our Facebook group at untameyourself.com forward slash Facebook. Um, and again, Martha, I know you're so busy. You mentioned jet lag, just coming back from Africa. We appreciate your time. <laughs> so, so much. Thanks for helping me with my dreams. Oh my God. Oh, thank you for helping me with mine. It oh, <laughs> so awesome. Thank you so much. We'll talk to you later and everyone else. Thanks for tuning in. Bye guys. Oh man, my friend Amateo this past weekend, I was speaking at his event and he said something so incredible, which was that sometimes when we have a complex problem, we think that the solution to the problem needs to be as complex as the problem, which isn't the case. Sometimes the solution is much simpler than the complexity or the perceived complexity of the problem. And so in our culture, in a lot of ways, we become attached to things needing to be complex or needing to be difficult or needing to be a struggle or needing to be hard work. So if you could put that stuff aside long enough to go, I just need to take the next best step and it, is, it can be simple. It might not be easy, but it can be simple.